Okay, let's get started then, shall we? Okay, so this is going to be the easy part of the course. <laughs> We're gonna talk about some course logistics. It'd be good to have everyone here so that they can vote for the exam or not vote for the exam. <laughs> oh, okay, are you gonna call them in? Okay. Oh, there comes Matt. Okay, cool. So basically, this is hopefully why you were here. Uh, essentially, that's the title of the course. And I think I'm gonna see you for a week. You can feel free to contact me anytime during the week. I have time to meet people if you're, if you're interested also. Uh, but basically, this is the intended schedule. Uh, I don't think we're gonna cover all of that. It's a bit aggressive. I think we have 19 or 20 hours. And we may go longer if you want, but I don't think, there's a, there's a lot here, as I said. So we've covered the first one, not yet. Uh, and this is what I intend to cover. I've already said many of these, so I'm not gonna go over this again. Uh, but hopefully it'll be fun. Are there any topics that people are ex very interested in covering that are beyond this? I think this covers a lot in memory. <laughs> okay, if you have any thoughts, you can email me. Uh, especially in your first assignment. So this course uh, basically will cover many problems and potential solutions related to the design of memory systems in the, this is old wording, many core era, I think in the uh, heavily uh, energy constrained era maybe. Uh, and the design of the memory system poses many, many issues today I think. Uh, and these are difficult research issues and also engineering issues, so people are really facing this today in the design of memory chips, but also in processor chips. It's basically everywhere. So this is, I think, that's why I'm really excited about doing research in this area, because whatever you find that's important will have impact uh, on this topic. And these are important fundamental problems. These are not problems that come and go, basically. They're, they impact a lot of applications, not just a single application, but many applications have this huge bottleneck with memory today. That's why I find this exciting also. And as I said, they're industry relevant problems. These are immediately relevant problems. And they're going to stay relevant for a long time, basically. If I had to bet, they will stay relevant forever. <laughs> it's going to be difficult to solve the memory problem completely, I think. Uh, and I think these are problems whose solutions can really revolutionize the world. And depending on what you mean by revolution, of course, <laughs> this could be anything, but uh, these are essentially can impact the world significantly. And I think I'll give you examples of these. Uh, as we go along. And I think uh, we're not, we, we still, clearly we haven't solved the problem completely. So many creative and insightful solutions are needed to solve these problems that we're going to talk about. And I think hopefully this course will enable you to think about some of these solutions or use some of the things that you learned in what you're doing in your research, right? Essentially, my goal is to have you acquire the basics to develop such solutions uh, by hopefully covering fundamentals in memory and also some cutting edge research in memory. Uh, clearly, we're not able to cover everything in memory, uh, but we're gonna cover, hit the key points. Does this sound like a good goal? Okay. Okay, this is the course information. I think I've given you a lot, or you can easily find me anyway, but you can always email me. This is my phone number, cell phone. I use WhatsApp a lot. WhatsApp is in many ways easier, faster. <laughs> if you use WeChat, you can also find me, actually. How many people here use WeChat? Nobody? No or use? Okay, use. No, nobody. Use? No? Okay, one person knows. How many people use WhatsApp? Okay, more people. Okay, yeah, feel free to add me and contact me. And feel free to find me during breaks or email me anytime. As I said, I'll be here for a week. And uh, I, we have created a website, but there's also an official website. So you should check the official website for sure because Clarice uploaded some reading material right now over there. You should see three readings over there. Uh, but we will later update this website with videos and all of that stuff. Uh, and for the curious, actually, uh, I've given a course, a much more accelerated course on memory systems with the same title uh, on ACASIS. How many people know about ACASIS here? This is the Computer Architecture Summer School that happens in Italy uh, every, every July, actually. I was there last July. And this course is really based on the material over there, but it's a much more extended version. 
I've given this course also in many places before. The last incarnation of it was in Technion, in uh, Israel Institute of Technology in Jul October in 2018. But you get the benefit of more up-to-date materials <laughs> at this point. <laughs> okay, so who am I? That's me. <laughs> Abdullah is taking the course and is also helping me with the, some of the logistics, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the, basically, let me give you some advice on how to make the best out of this course. You guys have been very attentive, which is good, uh, and interactive also, that's also good. I think the lectures will be fast paced, so be alert. Is this a good speed so far? Should I slow down, go faster? Maybe, some people think I should go faster, I think. Okay, I can do it, but I'm not sure if you will enjoy it as much. <laughs> So do the readings and explore even more. I will provide many references and we'll have many review assignments as we said. Uh, you get the best out of it if you actually do the readings as much as possible. And I know you're, it's not possible to, all of, all, to do all of the readings, but they're actually really interesting readings, I think. Uh, and if you need to go back and reinforce with the fundamentals, I'll provide pointers to some basic materials if you need it, uh, you can go over them. And I have a lot of lecture videos and slides online. You can easily find uh, these materials online. There's no shortage of it, I think. Uh, and I like this quote from Pasteur that says, chance favors the prepared mind. <laughs> it's all about preparation in the end. Uh, you can, if, you're, if you're prepared, uh, you can make yourself lucky. And you can find the big thing. If you're not prepared, you may miss the big opportunity, always. That's why I think all of these readings are really important and understanding uh, is really important. So I'll cover this very quickly because you'll do some paper reviews in this course. Have you done paper reviews before? How many people did? Okay, everybody did, that's good. Now I'll tell you my way of pa doing paper reviews which can hopefully help. Uh, this is the anatomy of a pa good paper review or a talk. Uh, I think these are similar things actually. Even when you're writing papers, it's good to ha follow some of this. So I think the first part of the paper review is really summary. Of course, there's a title of the paper and <laughs> uh, authors and stuff, but after that, what is the problem the paper is trying to solve? What are the key ideas of the paper? What are the key insights? Uh, what are the key mechanisms? What is the implementation? Very briefly again. Uh, what are the key results, key conclusions that the authors reach? That's a good summary, I think, if you hit these points. And then the, comes the more critical part of the review. Uh, what are the strengths of the paper? And it's good to list these as bullets, simple bullet points. And of course, most important ones, but it's also good to order these strengths in terms of the most important one to the least important one. So for example, I think Strengths of a paper could be it opens a new research area that nobody has thought of. That's a more important strength than it shows that this can be improved by 5% right? or 10x. Even 10x is lower than it opens a new research area, clearly, right? Well written is also somewhere, right? But it's not, it's hopefully not the biggest strength of a paper. The paper is well written. Uh, so it's good to have these strengths nailed down well and in order. Uh, the harder part, uh, well, basically, that's all, is it well written, dot, dot, dot. But I already said more than what this covers. The weaknesses are also very important because this could lead to improvements over the paper. And I think this is um, even more important than strengths, but you should do justice to the strengths as well because every paper has a strength and weakness. If you cannot find a strength in a paper, you should question yourself. <laughs> that's the first thing to do <laughs> and see if you can find a strength. And if you still cannot find the strength, try it again, <laughs> and then try it again, okay? <laughs> if you cannot find the strength after three tries, okay, maybe then you can put no strength. <laughs> but every paper usually has a strength. Uh, weaknesses, I mean, it's easy to find weaknesses in papers because no paper is perfect. That's absolutely true. Uh, no paper I've written is perfect. No paper anybody else in the world has written is perfect because you simply cannot cover every question, right? Even related to a very, uh, narrow problem. It's not possible, right? People come up with many, many questions. But of course, different papers have different weaknesses. So it's, uh, it's important to be critical over here and think critically. It's true that every paper and idea has a weakness. Uh, this doesn't mean the paper is necessarily bad. It means that there is room for improvement and future research can potentially accomplish this, right? Again, it's important to uh, order the weaknesses from the most important to the least important, right? For example, uh, the weaknesses in terms of problem is probably the one of the most important, right? Maybe the problem doesn't exist and the paper is trying to solve that. It's usually not the case. 
again, if you think that way, maybe there are some cases where the problem exists, right? Maybe the problem doesn't generally exist, but there could be some conditions under which the problem exists. So it's good to think broadly, I think, whenever you're thinking about papers. Uh, and also, it's uh, usually the weaknesses of the mechanism are a problem. Maybe the authors forgot to describe some part of the mechanism, so that's a problem, right? Or the mechanism doesn't work well. It has a, some flaw, fatal flaw. That's also important to think about. It's good to, this is where you should really think critically to find the flaws. And of course, uh, these are harder flaws to find, unless the paper has obvious flaws. Uh, easier flaws to find are usually with evaluation, <laughs> metrics, those are actually very easy to criticize any paper on. You can criticize the evaluation much more easily than the mechanism, right? Because the mechanism may make sense some way. It may be not work under all conditions, but the evaluation you can always criticize. Oh, what does it, they evaluated workloads X, Y, Z, but they didn't evaluate workload T. Right, that's, but let's not go into rat holes. I'll show you some pictures of rat holes soon. <laughs> so some weaknesses are easier to find, some weaknesses are harder to find. Uh, you should try to find the harder weaknesses so that you can improve because testing for workload T may not be as exciting, right, clearly. Okay, uh, so this is important. And I think this is very important for reviewing papers also. It's good to think critically because that's where you can give useful feedback to the authors. But you should also give fair feedback to the authors because you don't want to be penalizing a work because uh, of unfair criticism, right? Yes, people may not be able to test all of the workloads. I'll give you some stories when we talk about papers, like uh, from the review process as well. So you, I, I'm sure some of you are going through review processes, so it's good to think about these. Like well, uh, when, we, when we propose some DRAM changes, sometimes we get reviews saying that, a weakness, saying that, oh, DRAM manufacturers will never do this. So think about whether or not that's a fair weakness. <laughs> First of all, it's completely subjective, right? There's no objective basis for that. Uh, maybe they can justify it with area cost. Okay, maybe the area cost is 1%. How do you know the air manufacturers will not do this, right? And if you don't put the idea out, then they will never do this. You can guarantee that they will never do this. <laughs> if you put the idea out, maybe they will do it, right? Or maybe somebody will do it. Maybe it's not going to be the air manufacturer. Maybe it's somebody else designing the phase change memory who will do it. So it's good to think about these. I, I can give you only examples that I've been exposed to, of course, right? But this is very important uh, to do in your own paper reviews also. But for example, the, uh, another uh, uh, a fair criticism could be uh, the cost of the mechanism is not completely properly evaluated. You should evaluate this part also. Maybe it's not a huge weakness, but that's also an easier weakness to find, right? Okay. Okay, this is uh, an even more interesting part, thoughts and ideas, for example. Can you do better? I think uh, this is very important for the papers that you're reviewing. Do you have any ideas building on the paper? It may not be possible, of course, all the time, but it's good to put your thoughts. Uh, you may not put this all in a paper review that you give to the authors, <laughs> but you may want to do this uh, here so that you can actually develop ideas and I can give you feedback. And the last one is maybe takeaways, what you learned, enjoyed, disliked, why? It's good to have this also. Uh, and maybe discussion starts and then questions. If you have some questions to ask, you can put them in the review also. And the review should be short and concise. Like if you're giving a talk, it should, you can do all of this in 20 minutes or less. If you're doing a review, in this case, we're not gonna give talks here because you don't have time, but if you're doing a review, it's, you can go for less than one page, right? That sounds reasonable. Of course, I didn't specify the font size. <laughs> you can cram more <laughs> things on a page, but they're, they're reasonable font size. Uh, but of course the font size depends on the font also, so <laughs> we can go into a big rat hole over here <laughs> on what font page means. <laughs> okay, so this is the suggested paper review format uh, that I have. Essentially this is a summary, uh, this is a problem and goal, key ideas and solution, what is the novelty, what are the mechanisms and implementation, major results and takeaways and conclusions. This is one way of doing it. And then this is the critique part, essentially, and new ideas part, strengths, weaknesses, maybe you can consider some alternatives, some new ideas or problems that you have, and some brainstorming and discussion. Of course, it's a loose thing, and I have some example reviews on uh, my course websites that you can find. Uh, maybe I'll email you if Abdullah reminds me, or you can remind me if I don't email them. So some more advice. Uh, so be very critical. Uh, 
always think about better ways of solving the problem or related problems. I think this is a good way of actually doing research because you can actually spawn new problems uh, by reading papers. I enjoy reading papers partly because of this. Uh, you'll, you'll learn, of course, when you're reading papers, but you also enable new problems and new solutions uh, as well. So if you can question the problem as well, maybe you can find other problems, right? And it's good to read background papers. Uh, whenever I read a nice paper especially, I go through the background papers and try to read them as well. So this could be, of course, a re recursive process that could take a long time. Uh, both past and future, because there could be future papers building on the paper that you're reading. And I think this is how things progress best in science and engineering, and this is how you can make big leaps uh, by building on what was their past. Of course, you can al always completely come up with a new problem as well without reading anything, but it's not clear if you're prepared enough to be able to do that if you don't read anything, right? That's why I like that quote from Pasteur, chance favors the prepared mind, right? Okay, and this enables uh, critical analysis, and I guess I promised it over here, so you'll have to remind me for sure. <laughs> Okay, I like this picture. Has anyone seen this sort of picture before? Has anyone seen a rat hole before? Has anyone been in a rat hole before? Rat hole conversation? Probably yes. <laughs> Basically, this is actually a picture from, I'm going to skip to the next slide, this book. Has anyone seen this book? This is a beautiful book uh, by Rod Jane. Actually, it's, it's a seminal book, I would say, uh, on how to do a computer systems performance analysis. If you haven't seen it, take a look at it. Uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, techniques that they talk about in experimental design measurement, simulation, and modeling. I just read whatever is written over there. But a lot of theory as well as experiments. That's a, I, I like this book a lot. And this book all, not only has, has a lot of scientific material for this, but also interesting material like this. This is uh, a picture from that book. It's not exactly that picture, but it's a slide version of that picture by Rod Jane. Uh, and what this says is basically, uh, you can easily get into rat holes whenever you present performance results. Whenever you present an idea and performance results associated with it, uh, the decision maker, he's, he calls this the decision maker's games. The decision maker can always question the workload. <laughs> they can always question the metrics. They can always co question the configuration. And if you're not prepared for this discussion, the discussion can go in a rat, in a rat hole meaning that you get trapped in this rat hole and you can never get out. <laughs> That's the idea. So workload is a very important part, especially when you're doing computer systems performance analysis. You present data for workload X, and then they can say, oh, what about workload Y, Z, T, right? And this could go on forever. Uh, and the takeaway from my perspective is, it's important to evaluate the idea uh, at a more fundamental level than just related to the workloads that it's being evaluated with. So if you can somehow do that, and if you can distill the fundamental level of the idea independently of the workload as, as much as possible, then maybe you can convince the decision maker better. Right? He, uh, he, he discusses this in the context of, can you convince someone to build your idea, basically, or implement your idea? And that's someone who is the decision maker to implement the idea can say, OK, no, I cannot do it because you don't show me that it works for this workload or for this workload, or for this workload under these conditions. Right. This is very interesting. Uh, actually, uh, I guess we're not going to cover SIMD that much, but whenever I uh, talk about SIMD instructions, single instruction, multiple data, uh, the, for example, Intel decided to build the multimedia extensions in 1995 or so. You know about multimedia extensions, MMX? Now they're called AVX, I guess, Advanced Vector Extensions. So they transformed from MX to SSC, AVX. Uh, but it, there is a huge debate at Intel, basically, saying, should we build these multimedia extensions? And essentially, that focused a lot on the workload, and maybe metrics also later on, but workload. Basically said, if we build this, are there workloads that would take advantage of MMX? Right. It was motivated based on these workloads uh, that or video and image processing. Actually, the seminal paper on that that dis discusses the MMX extensions to Intel x86 architecture, uh, Alex Peleg and Uri Weiser, who are the authors of the paper, I'd recommend that. It's an IEEE Micro in 1997, I think. Maybe 1996. Okay, one of those years. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, that discusses the importance of adding these uh, uh, SIMD extensions. And 
people said, okay, we don't have these workloads. Well, clearly you won't have the workloads yet if the extensions are not there, right? So you need to actually convince the decision maker at a more fundamental level that if you put these extensions in, there will be a lot of workloads that would benefit. Clearly you cannot test all of the workloads in the world because that's a lot of effort. And in a single paper, it's very difficult to do. Maybe you do a series of papers, but how many papers are you going to do, right? Or how many evaluations you're going to do? It could take a lifetime. So you need to really argue at a more fundamental level. Uh, and clearly workload is also tough to predict, right? We, we use those SIMD extensions for bioinformatics, for example, as I mentioned. I don't think they were designed for that purpose. So it's really important to argue at that level also. There will be workloads to come at some point. But of course the danger is they may never come. <laughs> Whenever you implement something in hardware, that's true for software also, but hardware is a bit more uh, difficult. You put something into hardware, you put uh, all this investment, and if the workload doesn't exist, then you have a problem. <laughs> Okay, so this is, it's, it's good to not go into the rat holes in this course at least. Uh, we'll talk a lot about workloads, but this is a conversation that may never end. Metrics is another one, like have you, t you've tested metric X, but have you tested Y, Z, T? Okay, you improve performance, but what happens to energy? Right. Well, sometimes you can argue that it's obvious that energy will improve, right? <laughs> so if you argue, if you can argue that at a fundamental level, that's good. Of course, if you evaluate it, it's better, but there is limited effort and limited lifetime that you have, right? So this could also be uh, something that could be a rat hole. In fact, in the paper, uh, in the book, sorry, uh, I like the book's picture better. I should have really put the book's picture. Maybe it's in one of my slides somewhere. Uh, but basically, the workload is a deeper rat hole <laughs> somewhere and a bigger rat hole. Metrics is less deep. Configuration is less deep. So these rat holes actually are <laughs> different in terms of scale and size, depth and size. Configuration is also another one, basically. You can always question the configuration, right? Okay, you have two cores in this configuration. Why, what if you evaluate four cores, eight cores? And this is endless also, as you can see, because you cannot possibly evaluate all of the possible configurations in the world, right? And if you multiply these together, you have an impossible thing at your hand, right, for evaluation. So it's good to not to uh, recognize these rat holes and say, okay, they didn't evaluate these workloads and move on. <laughs> and maybe evaluate the ideas at a more fundamental level than these three. And details, actually the, the list in the paper uh, goes over 20 other issues <laughs> in some order. And I'd recommend you take a look at it. And I'll try to find that slide. Uh, I don't have the book with me clearly, but you can find the book also. Okay. So there's some more advice on talks. Actually, I would recommend this uh, clear talk tips from one of my colleagues, uh, previous colleagues at CMU. There are very nice principles that he outlines over here at K1. This is more related to the talks, less related to the reviews. But I think this is very important for everything. Every sentence matters. That's true for the papers you write also, and also talks. And this is also for, true for the papers. Also for the reviews that you write, the audience, Whoever is reading is, they prefer not to think <laughs> in general. <laughs> Anybody who listens to you or reads something, they don't, they don't want to think in general. Uh, at least the average people, but most people also. Right? Especially if you want to convey a new idea, you would like to minimize the barrier to entry to that idea by ensuring that you write things such, or deliver the talk such that they do not have to think. So you just basically guide them. <laughs> I think that's a very good principle. And also, this is also uh, true for use also everywhere, I think, in writing. Surprises are bad. It's always good to say why you're doing something before uh, saying how you're doing something. I see sometimes uh, when I review papers, people just go into implementation, basically. This is how we did things. But I'm more interested in terms of why you do that thing that you're going to describe me how you do. <laughs> so that why is more important. That insight is more important uh, for most people actually. That high level is more important than the low level first. If you reorder the low level, that's not good because I don't have the insight. Uh, and then you can tell me the high level, but it's too late. If you tell me the low level only without telling the high level at all, that's a crime probably <laughs> because you never told me the insight. And, but if you do the high level first and the low level next, that's great. There are actually a lot of psychological studies related to this. People did a lot of experiments in cognitive psychology where they had subjects read text 
and some subjects read text without the high level. Some subjects read text with the high level provided first. And they did recall experiments and they showed that people who were provided their high level first can recall the text really well, but people who were never provided the high level text, they cannot recall very well, even after 10 minutes. So that's essentially set something over here that enables you to uh, recall things better. I can point you to the psychological studies actually. This is, I, I, I'm fascinated by psychology also. And one of my degrees was in psychology in undergraduate. So I really enjoyed that part of the psychology. <laughs> okay, uh, explain every figure graph or equation. This doesn't apply to their use, but clearly it's important in, a, in writing a paper uh, and also uh, giving talks. I, I like this also. When improving the talk, the audience is always right. That's mostly true for the review process, except not always. <laughs> this is assuming that uh, the audience is honest in general. And you should uh, assume that that's the case, unless otherwise proven. Sometimes the review process can get biased also. You may or may not have had examples of this. So you need to take this with a grain of salt. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that when we get to some particular uh, papers. So this is true if your audience is giving you direct feedback in front of you because you see them, they see you. But if they're hiding behind some review process that may be a little bit different dynamics. So that's where the review process differs a little bit, I think. Okay. So I switched to this, I guess this, you may think, what is the relevance of this? Uh, does anybody know who painted this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it says, I guess, there's a side channel that you can use. So it's Salvador Dali, actually. It's not him himself, but somebody else that he painted. And this was when he painted it, in 1924. So this is a boring picture, right? Does anybody find something really interesting in this picture? You don't think this is Salvador Dali, if you know his paintings when you look at this painting. It could be any random painter in the end. But this was his young age. So he was learning the principles of painting. That's why he painted this stuff. And then later, who painted this one? I guess it's going to be obvious here, beyond the side channel, it's the same painter. And this is one of the famous paintings, and you can see that it's crazy. And that's him in 1937. <laughs> So the point here is, again, I borrowed this from K1's talk. The takeaway here is learn the basic principles first before you consciously choose to break them. <laughs> Don't start with breaking the principles unless you're extremely good at it. <laughs> so it's good to learn the basic principles first and then, and then you can have the freedom to break them. And you can know how to break them also very well, like he did over here. He somehow figured out his niche and he broke them really well, right? Okay. Any questions? Okay, let me go through this material and then we can go back to memory systems. So there, there's a bunch of readings, we have videos and reference material. These are not required, this is just for your uh, benefit. As I mentioned, I gave this course, all of it is available online, you can look at it. Uh, this is a required paper, this is one of the required papers. Now you're getting your assignments. Uh, this is a paper that uh, I, I, I intentionally assigned some of these broader overview papers as the first required readings because I think this is the best way you can get a lot uh, out of reading. Uh, basically the benefit per word will be higher <laughs> probably or benefit per page, however you uh, do the metrics. It's not a single topic. Uh, it's a very broad overview of processing in memory, for example. It's longer, like 15 pages, but I think it's not, not hard to read. So this is one of the required readings. I'll, I'll give you three required readings. The second one is on Rohammer. I mentioned this already. This is also, but this also gives you a good perspective, I think, after five years. Uh, you'll get a completely different feeling if you read the original Rohammer paper, which I would also recommend. Uh, but it doesn't give you the historical perspective of that. This also gives you a historical perspective which is not present in, uh, in a single conference paper. And the third one is a bit old, but it still uh, is uh, relevant, I think. It doesn't cover the material since, I think this was published December 2014, January 2015, since four, five years or so. 
but it gives you a broad overview that the other two papers don't necessarily provide. Uh, and this is also required. Does that sound good? Three readings that cover a lot of the material in this course, actually. And you can do the readings, and then please do the reviews. And I'll assign you more reviews as you wanted 20 papers, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wanted 20 papers, okay. Okay, maybe we'll negotiate then. <laughs> well, you get at least three. How about that? <laughs> That's a good start, right? <laughs> okay, there are a bunch of other readings that I'm not assigning. This is actually also very interesting, but uh, you can read it on your own. And I already mentioned some of these. This is actually the first paper that I had written on the topic. It's actually not the first paper. It's a slightly extended version of a paper that I, was, I presented in May 2013. This was before a lot of the research that we've done in Rowhammer, for example. Uh, and in any memory computation also. Uh, it's good to read if you have time. It's only five pages, actually. This is the shorter version. And uh, if you're interested in flash memory, this is actually uh, a paper that uh, you could learn a lot from because it, it covers a lot of the work in flash memory-based flow state drives and errors related to it. We may cover that, some, some parts of it, but we're not going to cover all of that. There's a new version of it, actually. This was published in Proceedings of the IEEE, uh, but we have a new version that's on archive. Okay, there are related videos. If you, basically, you, you have no shortage of material if you want to learn more. That's the purpose of this. And we also have a lot of open source tools. If you want to do research in any of this, as I mentioned, uh, yeah, I mentioned the SoftMC over here. That's one example, but we actually release a lot of simulators. For example, if you want to do research on processing in memory, it's not here yet, but uh, we have a emulator uh, that has processing in memory, emulator PIM. We released it just recently. Uh, and there are a bunch of other open software that you, open source software that you can use. And we keep opening up a lot. So if you want to do research on SSDs, this is, this is perhaps the uh, most recent simulator that was released. Uh, and if you want to do research on GPUs, as you can see, there are some simulators that we release as well. And there's a lot more. Uh, on our website. And if you want to find the papers that are referenced, you can find them online. If you don't find any of them, let me know. <laughs> that means there's a broken link. Okay, let's talk about grading. <laughs> this is the most fun part of the course, I assume. But you're not here for grades, I assume, right? How, how many uh, credits do you need for a PhD here? 18, okay. That's not a lot, right? And this is three credits? Okay, so how many hours of work do you, are you supposed to put in for a three credit course? Say it again, <laughs> it's not that well defined. Okay, that's good, <laughs> okay. So this is what I have in mind. At least eight paper reviews, does that sound reasonable? And you get graded based on that. Actually, there should be another one. Okay, this is better. <laughs> I forgot to delete that slide. Wait, wait, no, it should be a combination of both. Okay, I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so I think at least eight paper reviews uh, and various assignments given during lecture, but they're not gonna be that much really, mostly optional, participation, and I don't know, final exam. Wow, this is really a mess. So you should really mesh them together somehow. What do you think? I mean, this is, I don't intend this to be a heavily graded course really. I think of this more of a uh, learning experience where you need to do something to get a grade because there, there is some requirement, clearly. But I don't want this to be heavily graded. So I think the paper reviews are, for me, the most important part so that you can learn. You can also exercise your critical thinking at your own pace. They're not immediately due. Participation, of course, is important, but I, clearly I'm not gonna take any detailed notes about participation. And I don't know about this one. So what do people feel? What do people feel about paper reviews? Who wants the paper reviews? Depends if you took the deadline. Uh, okay. Uh, so the deadline is, is there a deadline? <laughs> for grading? I guess one month after the end of the course. Basically, that's the deadline for grading. That's when I need to submit the grades. So I would like the paper reviews at least two weeks before that. So two, at, uh, two weeks after the end of the course, let's say. Does that sound reasonable? So 
they essentially have two weeks for doing eight paper reviews, which is not bad, I think. And this is all in class anyway. What about the final exam? Do people want the final exam? Let's see. <laughs> this is the hard, or maybe it's the easy, easy question. Who wants a final exam? I didn't see any hands. <laughs> Who wants a final exam? <laughs> okay. Who doesn't want a final exam? Don't be shy. Okay, I see four hands at least. Who abstains? Sorry. <laughs> Nobody abstains? <laughs> okay, two, <laughs> because you know how it will go. <laughs> Okay, I guess nobody wants a final exam then. Okay, if nobody wants a final exam, and if I'm not required to give a final exam, I don't have any incentive to give a final exam, frankly. <laughs> so we should really focus on the paper reviews uh, and participation and various assignments given during the lecture. How about that? I mean, these will not be hard assignments. This may be a, a short review, as we will see in the next slide, actually. The next assignment is very important. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna fix these slides, this is a mess. But basically, count on this, at least eight paper reviews, but probably eight is a good number. But the more you do, the better for your learning, of course. Participation important, no final exam, and that's various assignments. So the first assignment is this. <laughs> There's a due date associated with it. Hopefully it's not a terrible due date because the assignment is not that hard. But I don't, uh, I don't mind if you delay it a bit more. So basically, uh, I'd like to get to know you at least a little bit. Uh, please send me an email. Uh, hopefully you put a subject that's like this with your name. And please introduce yourself and answer several questions. Or feel free to add more, of course. Like what is your educational background? Where did you do your undergraduate degree? Uh, what degree are you studying for? I think that's easy. Or when did you start your degree? Why are you taking this course? Hopefully more than just getting credit. But otherwise, why would you en endure the sun? Uh, what are your career goals? What do you want to do in the future? Maybe you don't know, but you can say, like, what do you expect to do? What is your passion? You can tell me anything, I don't know. Your research, your photography passion, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and any other thing you would like to tell, basically. This is a very easy assignment, I think that should be doable by the end of today. What do you think? <laughs> okay. So hopefully you know what to do, basically. <laughs> and that's, that's part of the grade. <laughs> okay. And that's the end of the course logistics, unless anybody wants to discuss something related to the course. Any thoughts? Does this all sound good and fair? <laughs> <laughs> 